Y buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches, dependiendo cuando están recibiendo esta información. Mi nombre es Rafael Vázquez y tengo el privilegio el día de hoy de hablar con la doctora Daisy González, quien trabaja en el estado de California. Y en el estado de California tenemos colegios comunitarios, tenemos universidades públicas y ella trabaja en el sistema más grande que es el sistema de colegios comunitarios. Um, bienvenida, doctora uh, Daisy González. Gracias por aceptar la invitación de tener esta charla con usted el día de hoy. Buenos días. Es un gran honor estar aquí con todos ustedes. Y una de las cosas que para mí es importante, tuve el privilegio de estar en una conferencia recientemente uh, que se enfocaba en los hombres afroamericanos, más que nada a uh, Eighty Men, eh, ahí estaba usted y dio unas palabras súper importantes que todavía estoy tratando de ver si puedo obtener eh, una copia del, del video, porque su presentación de usted, su introducción de usted fue corta, pero lo que más que nada me llamó la atención fue como de directo, uh, el ver a alguien en la posición como usted, y espero ahorita nos diga qué posición tiene en el, en el estado de California, pero ver a alguien en una posición de poder, podremos decir, como usted, y que fuera tan directa en decir que tenemos responsabilidades de educar y proveer oportunidades equitativamente a todas las personas, es algo que gente en la política lo dice, pero usted toma la acción necesaria para demostrar que esto se debe de hacer. So, primeramente, si nos puede decir qué posición tiene en el estado de California y de ahí, una vez más, ¿qué es lo, ¿de qué se encarga? Y vamos a empezar de ahí a cómo llegó a este libro. Thank you, Rafael. I mean, I think my message was really, for me, very simple, right? That we all have a responsibility. El mensaje en verdad era de que todos tenemos una responsabilidad, pero que todos somos líderes. Porque creo que lo más alto que llegamos se nos olvida to todo lo que hemos pasado y por qué queríamos llegar allí. Y para mí siempre ha sido algo que he tratado de nunca perder, porque a veces se pierde you know, tu idioma, tu cultura, pero no por qué querías llegar a un lugar y, y qué, qué querías hacer en este mundo. Uh, nunca creí yo que yo iba a llegar a ser este deputy chancellor, que todavía a veces ni me la creo cuando la gente dice que cuando me van a introducir o me preguntan cómo es que has llegado allí, Um, but Deputy Chancellor of California's Community Colleges, 116 community colleges in the state of California, the largest system in the United States, for the first time ever led by a state chancellor, uh, Eloy Ortiz Oakley, who is also a Latino. And for the very first time in 2018, my office hired a deputy chancellor that actually had a PhD, right, a doctorate, mm -hmm. and that was a woman of color. I was the second woman to ever be appointed into this role. You have to be elected by the Board of Governors and you have to then be supported by the governor of the state of California. I oversee academic affairs, student services, professional development for the system, technology, and then certainly our HR and every other division in the system. It has been a challenging time, I am assuming now with COVID-19 as a result of overseeing so many pieces, right? The, um, the uh, teacher part of it out there, the student services, the technology, how do we make sure that all students have access to the tools to be able to be successful? And, and just as important, it's not just about throwing money out there, but perhaps how do we hold the community colleges responsible uh, and accountable? I think that one of the things that I really enjoy about that uh, workshop that you did that time or that introduction it was brief it was about the accountability how do we uh, hold the system accountable for what it's mandated legally to do right um y ahora me gustaría regresar i would like to go back and learn about where you come from right were you born in california did you migrate um you know what was your upbringing like if you can share with us y nos puede dar un poco de información acerca de dónde nació, uh, cómo, uh, you know, dónde creció aquí en California, tal vez, uh, para que la gente entienda que no fue fácil llegar a la posición que usted tiene. 
Well, crecí en el Valle de San Fernando, San Fernando Valley, en Van Nuys, California, y me mudé a diferentes ciudades porque a la edad de dos, um, mis padres, este, you know, ellos vinieron a este país para realizar sus sueños, para no crecer también ellos en la pobreza. Mi mamá tenía 14 años cuando cruzó uh, de México um, y Crecí con una familia y tenía cuatro hermanos y hermanas, pero a la edad de dos, este, I entered into foster care. Entré a una casa de crianza y miré a mis padres creo que dos o tres veces después, hasta que cuando cumplí 17, ya no eres parte del sistema. But it was a really traumatic time, if I could just be honest. Um, I grew up in a really poor, um, you know, low income family. My mom had a second grade education. My dad had zero education. Um, when I was seven, I, you know, they would return me. They would try to do reunification. My job was to sign checks because my mom couldn't write in cursive. So she taught me to write in cursive. And I was an English learner until third grade because neither of my parents spoke English. And every time I would go back into the system, I would learn English from the staff that would work in the, in the group homes or, you know, in the big facilities. And that's how I learned how to read. And in third grade, after going to four different elementary schools, um, they reassessed me and they said, we think you're ready for English, you know, uh, starting fourth grade, you're going to learn in English only. Um, but that story for me and just thinking about the journey has been so important because I ended up becoming a teacher of all things, right? I make it out of foster care, end up homeless after foster care because I was 17. I had nowhere else to go. Uh, the staff had told me, if you emancipate early, you're going to get additional financial aid. And I didn't know any better. I was 17 and I had great mentors, but I believed it. And the only thing that happened was, well, you're not a part of our system. We can't give you a home. And I ended up homeless. I was uh, very lucky, but more importantly, I had a lot of help, a lot of help, um, a lot of really incredible teachers that gave me a place to live when I was homeless. They helped me apply to college. I went to community colleges all throughout high school. Um, so, I, so for me, it's almost like coming home, right? Community colleges are family because in order to graduate even from high school as a foster youth, I had missed out on so many classes that I needed to make up credits. And so in high school, I went to community colleges just to graduate and get a GED on time, right? Then I went to college and I, the same kind of thing happened all over again. I graduated with a BA in public policy because even back then I knew that the work was really about changing policy in order to have power, right? That there was a reason why change was so slow. And so when I made it to a four-year institution, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study public policy so that one day I can change laws. I don't know how I knew that. It was probably all the lawyers that I dealt with as I was growing up. And so I ended up becoming a third grade teacher though. I was 21, uh, moved to Fairfield, California, a rural community teaching primarily Latinos. And I, touched, uh, I taught dual immersion. And it was probably the hardest job I've ever had. Harder than this job, believe it or not. And the reason for that is, and I think Rafael, you could identify, right? You're a teacher in the classroom. You think you're there to do a job, but you're really the social worker, the friend, the mentor to their parents, right? You, and, and it takes a specific type of person to take on that, that love for human beings. And so I ended up kind of doing three jobs, right? Teaching after school, reading programs, lunch programs in the summer to make sure that my students could have food, So never could I have imagined that I would be doing this. If anything, I ended up here because of the students. Because what I learned after two years of teaching in the classroom was that there were never enough resources. I couldn't even make photocopies. And I remember thinking my second year in teaching, this is not fair. This is not right. And so my second year, I decided to apply to fellowship programs in Sacramento. And I remember just Googling like California and public policy. Y me salió pues allí en la internet un fellowship que decía California State Capital Fellows Program. And I applied. I got three interviews, got into the Assembly Fellowship, and that really launched my career. I ended up, because of my students, after three years of teaching, left to the State Assembly. And my job in 2008, 9, 10 
during the budget crisis, if you recall, was to make budget cuts. And my approach there was kind of the same. How do I make sure my, my assignment was $11 billion. I didn't even know how many zeros there were in billions. Like that was my first assignment was like, you're going to manage 11 billion. And I remember making a lot of mistakes, but more importantly, when they would ask me, one of my assignments was cut foster care. And I was like, absolutely not. We are not doing that. Fine cut health and human services and we want you to cut department of develop developmental disabilities like I can't even say it because I remember how much my heart hurt and I remember that that day I said I went to my boss and I said you want me to cut 60 percent of the state budget how do I do that and he said I don't know go figure it out and so one of the things that I did is I sent a letter to all the advocates and the, the DDS community and I basically said help me understand how last year's budget cuts impacted you and if we needed to make further cuts, where might we make them? Well, I ended up with 20 boxes with the same letter that said, don't cut me. <laughs> and, and that's so important to me because then that created the, we need to listen to people, right? We need to listen and learn from their humanity. What I learned there set my career because I learned that I couldn't just send a letter, that I needed to sit down with people and I needed to help them understand that I needed them to be a part of the journey and a part of the leadership. And I ended up developing because they were leaders, they were the experts, right? And what I learned from there is that we ended up creating budget stakeholder work groups. And it was, let's sit down and figure out the sources of power. And I want to say this out loud, because one of the things that I learned was that when you're thinking about a big problem you want to solve, what I learned in that room was that we weren't trying to just cut a budget and ruin people's lives. What we were trying to dismantle were sources of power. And one of the things that I learned there was there was a vendor who owned the, you know, had a monopoly for transportation of people with disabilities in the system. And he had a really big stake in how people would get transported. But if our state diversified, we could achieve most of the savings, right? The cuts just from that. And it took a person with a disability in the room feeling empowered to say, hold up, instead of cutting my services and how many times I get to see my doctor, why don't you put me in a bus first? Because I want to be reintegrated into the community and I can ride a bus. You don't need to hire a private taxi. And that led the whole world, you know, that entire room to realize, wait a minute, <laughs> this is about power and one person who holds all the dollars in their hand. And I swear that let us score like 40% of the savings, which meant that we could, we could get there right slowly. But that, that, um, my background and how I got here is really education, right? And I think we'll touch a little bit about that. But learning about state policy making and knowing that if you could create policies and design them in a way that could integrate the dollars, right? Because you can create all the policies you want, but unless you're controlling the money, nothing is going to change. And that takes us into that conversation of at what point Right, it, you, it was your experiences growing up, especially when you go into the foster care system, you see your parents lose absolute power, right, over your lives. Um, and sometimes the system does need to come in because our parents cannot take care of us. Sometimes the system completely misunderstands what's happening in our own households. I've been talking recently about how painful and how traumatic it must be for LGBTQI community members, the children specifically, the young adults who may be in Latinx households where, you know, the church has told them that being a member of the LGBTQ community is an unhealthy thing, it's a negative thing, it's an evil thing. And yet these children have been um, almost incarcerated in their own homes. And the teachers like yourself, where they, the you know resources of safety and support and they haven't had that and so you growing up in the foster care system you understood very quickly who has the power who determines uh, at what point you go home or don't go home where else do you go and so i think that really pushed you to uh, again become more involved and now you're in a position where you can make decisions that affect the lives of, I think it's like 2.5 million people, right? 
talk to us about at what point did you decide that this was the place that you needed to be in? You know, I think I um, want to address because I, I, I'm not ashamed of my story anymore. It took me a really long time to not be. Um, but I did grow up in a, in a very violent and unhealthy household. And, you know, but you learn as an adult to just appreciate, you know, even the journey and certainly that your parents had a, as immigrants and living in poverty, right? And, and the, the baggage that they even carry to even cross that border at a very young age. But I grew up in, in a family that even, even with limited education, no matter all the bad that they came with, they were hustlers. They believed that anything was possible. I mean, it takes dreamers to come to this country and build something out of nothing. And so I really, I, I think even though it's a love-hate relationship, I think that's what my parents taught me, right? To take risk and to that anything is possible. And, and honestly, just that, that grit that you just keep going. Um, and I remember I was in a panel most recently and someone asked me a question like this and it was actually a young high school student. And he said, this is before COVID of course, when we could meet with students in person. And he said, when did you realize you wanted to be a leader? And, and it was like, a, it was a really good question because I was on a panel with all these incredible women, you know, who were other leaders, other Latinas that had made it to be the first Latina of whatever, right? And so I said, you know, that's a really interesting question, but I want to tell you about the memory that rushed back to me because now it's been like a really, a really good reminder of how I ended up here. When I was in foster care, I lived in a group home and there were seven of us in that group home and we spent weeks advocating for them to wash our sheets. And so, in, you know, like you, like you mentioned, right, sometimes it's like you're imprisoned by, by these different spaces. But in this case, we asked for clean sheets for about two months. Some of the foster youth and we were in our teens now, right, we were like 13, 14, most of us were between those ages. And a lot of them had rashes just, you know, from, from dirty sheets. And I remember one of them just said, I've had enough. What do you think we should do? And I said, okay, I have a plan. <laughs> Somehow I always had a plan. And if you work with me today, you'll know that there's always a plan because I believe that anything is possible if all we do is work together. I said, I have a plan tomorrow. I want you to take the sheets off of your beds and I want you to just don't wear the clothes to go to school. Don't put on shoes. Don't get your backpacks. Just put the sheets in a ball in the front of the door and we're all gonna to refuse to go to school. I didn't know that it was gonna work, but it did, right? Because they couldn't explain how seven kids from the same group home weren't gonna to go to school. And I learned in that moment, and as I was reflecting on, on the question from the student, how do you navigate power? Um, so to, to your question about like, why this role? My journey from becoming a, a third grade teacher to entering policy to then deciding to become a doctor, which by the way, I didn't even know what a PhD was, right? I had, I didn't know what billions were. A mentor inspired me to do that job. And then after two years of doing the job, he said, you need to go get a higher education degree. And I said, okay, well, in what? And he said, like, like he asked, like he told me before, I don't know, figure it out. And so I remember going into like Google like this is back in 2010, like Googling higher education. <laughs> and I ended up doing the research and I came back to him and I said, I think I want to become a doctor. And he said, good, in what? And then I said, I don't know. And he said, well, then go figure it out. And after doing the research and coming back, I realized that I didn't want to study policy anymore. I wanted to understand human beings. I wanted to understand why they were making the decisions that they were making. And what was the, the power sphere that controlled their lives? Because I, I fundamentally believe that I think people are, are good. It's the things that they are surrounded by, the opportunities, the resources that they are provided that design, but also control every action that they can take, right? Even, even if you want to be good. So I go get this PhD, I graduate and no one would hire me. No one would hire me in policy work because I was quote unquote, overeducated. And I have the emails that still inspire me in my home office because I was told over and over again, you're overeducated. Sorry, you know, the, the hiring committee thought you were overeducated. One email, even when I got the job and I tried to negotiate, told me you'll never be worth more than $50,000. Well, guess what? My journey has taught me that no one can define my worth. And so of course I said, no, thank you. <laughs> 
But I ended up here because I did end up in research. I ended up working at Stanford University, another place where I never could have dreamed of. And they hired me to lead the oldest research center in the state of California for education policy. And it's called Policy Analysis for California Education at Stanford. And I interview for the job and I'm sharing this because it really is a part of not being ashamed of who you are. They asked me, why do you want this job at Stanford? And I said, because I know that getting an education transformed my life. And I know what I will bring to your research center, the lives that we will validate and the solutions that we will create together. And here's how I'm going to do that. And I laid out a plan for them. They only asked me one question. They had 10. And after the one question, they said, we want to hire you. <laughs> and then I stayed there at Stanford. I did do all of those things. I helped uncover the lives of students who lived, in, in alter who lived and were going to alternative schools in the state of California who were always invisible because we never collected data. I studied rural communities and what, what was happening to those communities that were primarily serving Latino communities undocumented, but also the workforce that feeds this entire state. And then a year in, I met this incredible woman, Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher, who is the chair of the Appropriations Committee in the State Assembly. She was an alum and she was shocked to see another Latina at, the, at Stanford. And she said, who are you? What do you do? She ended up recruiting me to become uh, the appropriations uh, education expert. And so she said, will you be my principal education and economic development you know, consultant? And I said, uh, OK, when's the interview? And she said, tomorrow. So I literally had to show up the next morning. They let me in at 730 because I wasn't supposed to be on the interview roster, but they let, they let me interview. And then they asked me one question. They said, you know, this job is around creating policies and you're going to have to do it in a fiscally responsible way. How, what do you think this job is supposed to do? And I, I'm telling you this because it really did happen this way. I was in a room with her two hiring managers and her and she. And so the first question was, what do you think this job is about? And I said, well, I think this job will be analyzing thousands of bills and legislation and my job will be one, one thing. I said, yes, I'm going to give you the fiscal thing to do. What is fiscally responsible for the state? I'm also going to give you what is politically the right solution to bring people to the table. But at the end of the day, I'm only gonna present you with one solution, which makes my job very simple. My job will be to present you a solution that is the right thing to do. A mixture of all three things so that you never have to decide between whether something is fiscally responsible or politically right, or whether it's the right thing to do. And she looked at me and she said, I want her, make it happen. And she walked out of the room. And it sounds like a fairy tale, but it really did happen this way. I, I ended up working there, killing a lot of bills, helping change legislation so that it could actually help students and make it be feasible. After becoming a researcher, working in institutions, you kind of begin to learn like what's not really going to change culture or structure. And I made it here to this job because a man, Eloy Ortiz Oakley, believed in me. He ended up reaching out and he said, I want to learn about you. He's now the state chancellor of the system, by the way. And he said, I've heard a lot about you. I need someone that knows research and policy. Let's meet for coffee. And so I met him for coffee. And the funny part of the story is that I said no to the job offer twice. <laughs> and a part of it was that I didn't know who he was. And I wanted to truly believe and join the team. I was al already in a very good place, right? Getting to design all legislation for the state of California is, is really powerful, but also could transform the world. At least that's what I thought back then, right? And so I just remember thinking, I need to be in the place where I can do the most amount of good. Where can I do the most amount of good? And I was not convinced. So by the third meeting, he convinced me. Um, we talked about the culture shift, the structures that needed to change, how we might do it. And that's truly how I ended up in this job. Just always looking for, a lot of folks ask me, when are you gonna become president? When are you gonna go do X? That's not in my interest. I wanna be somewhere where I can change structures and culture. I want to prove that these ideas are actually feasible, which is when I meet other people, I say, when are you going to become president? Because I need you to go prove that it is real and that this work can happen and that we're not crazy to imagine that education could work differently. 
it, it's interesting. You've covered so many pieces. Um, and, you know, we talk about trauma, we talk about valuing ourselves, all of those pieces. I recently, um, you know, you have to adjust also in education. You, people who stay behind will eventually become, to a certain degree, irrelevant. So I now have a TikTok that I do every day uh, for my undocumented uh, community. Um, and yesterday, I believe, was the one about valuing yourself. You have to love yourself enough to be able to say, I'm not going to work for this much uh, money. Either I need more or it doesn't matter how much money you offer me. What you are wanting me to do for that money is uh, against everything I believe in. And I think that that's what you're talking about, right? Like somebody can offer you whatever millions of dollars to run a campaign to become the governor of California, whatever it is. If your heart is not in it, if the politics are too much, whatever the situation is, then we have to find or place where we feel that we can do the most change. So if you were a teacher in the same school, we don't know what the person in your position now would be you know, doing to make sure there's equitable access to education. And that's one of the things that again, really call, uh, caught my attention about what you were saying that time, um, the issue of equity. People throw the word equity here and there. And you know, as I said in a recent um, uh, workshop, uh, people talk about equity and equitable access to education, but very few are willing to one, give up their privilege to create equity or do the, their own work to be able to create that equitable access to education. And with that, um, again, I, I look forward to having another longer conversation on another time. I want to be respectful of your time. But I want to bring up something that is uh, super important to me and has always been super important. Um, and that is for undocumented community or undocumented students. How do we better support them so that they don't get this $1,600 sometimes? Not everybody even qualifies for that from the Calgary Mac, while our US citizens, residents, and other individuals with T1 visas, for example, can apply to FAFSA and get up to $6,000. And then the state funding, you know, what is it that people, individuals in your position, and then, or community members, what can they do to advocate for greater equity in this area of education? Um, and, and, and with that, I also wanna say, you know, you have that PhD and I think it's wonderful to know that you didn't know your journey and your goals. And a lot of kids uh, who are gonna either listen or watch this, they're gonna think that by tomorrow they should know where they're supposed to be in 20 years. And you and I are in the same boat. I finished my uh, bachelor's degree and <clears throat> that took a long time. And then one day this woman, colleague of mine who's now retired, from the college where I teach the same classes she used to teach, she said, when are you gonna do the masters? And I said, what's a masters, right? And she picked up the phone and she made some phone calls and somehow she got me uh, for free at this private college, I'm not gonna mention it, to do my masters, but I was working with the undocumented youth in my own time and I was working with the gang affiliated families and youth in our community. And I gave up that opportunity to go to that prestigious university um, because I knew where I needed to be at that moment. And eventually I went back and did my master's. But again, it's important that people understand not everybody has to get that PhD. Not everybody ha needs a master's. California needs people with certificates and associates and master's and bachelor's and everything else. But again, going back to this, how do we get more funding to our undocumented brothers, sisters, and non-gender conforming individuals? Thank you for the question. I think what's important to, to highlight here is for both of our journeys is that, you know, yes, no one can define our worth, but also we never know what we're going to be. I think I still am trying to figure out what I want to do one day. Right. And I think that's the, the scary part when you're, when you're growing up and you're a teenager, everybody wants to know, what are you going to do when you grow up? What is always certain. And there are two things that I know for sure, at least in my life, right. Um, loss and, and death will always be a part of the journey. 
But for me, an education transformed my life, right? I grew up with people telling me that I would probably end up pregnant by 16 in prison or, or juvie and that I would be lucky to even get a high school degree. Those things, I could have never imagined being here and it wasn't, and like your story, right? Till someone is telling you about it. I think we all have a role in that and as parents for Latinos, right? I don't think my parents could have ever even dreamed of this for me either. But I know that a part of the journey was the, the fact that they, they never challenged or even thought that education wasn't important, right? That, it, you know, even though they couldn't help you, mm -hmm. right? Teaching me how to write in cursive, even though it was gonna benefit them <laughs> was important. Um, but so part one of how do we help our undocumented students, our DACA students um, is really that one, we need to love the students that we have. And that's a part of the culture change that we're doing at California Community Colleges. Right, you don't get to pick and choose who you want to help. It's we love all the students that come to our system. We are very lucky to live in California, very progressive. But the real transformational work is really inside of the hearts of people. And that's the hardest part. The money's there. And I'm telling you, the money's there. And even when we our office sued the Trump administration three times just to get uh, the federal funding to be allowed to be given to veterans, students with disabilities, and undocumented students. And guess what? We won. But now the issue has been that fear, which is why it's about what's in the hearts of people, that even when you get the money, people need to take action. So even today, we're having to issue, you know, letters that say, yes, you can use your federal funding for this purpose, right? Like, you, you won't get sued. No one's going to come and investigate you. On the other end, you know, you also have FAFSA, but here in California, we have a dreamers application, lots of fears about fill, filling it out at the state level. And certainly for my job, it's a, about helping to train financial aid officers. One, yes, bring them more resources. But on the other end is that it is very much our responsibility to share with families and those students that we're here to protect them, right? We are here to support them. And I think a lot of the, the, the kind of like the initial barrier, right, is that misinformation and then that fear to take action. On the other end, there is also in California a really big fund to help students apply for, you know, for DACA, right, but also for their citizenship. Also money that's just sitting there, right, because we haven't built out the structures. We haven't dealt with the pieces where people either don't believe that this is important work, right, because we have those. We're afraid to do the right thing, or we are afraid to be the leaders that can connect people because that's what it's going to take, right? The money runs through the Department of Social Services, then runs through foundations and lawyers, but then who's actually reaching these families? So I think that's the bigger part of, of the work. Um, for me also though, um, what's very important is, yes, I'm not just a Latina, I'm not just a foster youth, right? When a student comes to your door, they're not just a veteran, a foster youth or a student with disabilities. They are all of that at the same time. And so when we talk about money, we should never be in a situation where we turn anyone away because we feel that they don't fit the, the boxes of what we think that money should be used for. And that's a big part of the work that we're doing at California's community colleges. What's that integration to how we serve students holistically? But more importantly, how we take that responsibility that if someone is willing to trust us with their dreams, all right, of getting a career education, a certificate, a BA, an AA, we are a part of that journey. So how do we help them? Uh, I look forward to talking with you about that and, and the work that we're doing at California's 116 community colleges. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate the time. And definitely, I think this conversation needs to continue. Um, and again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have this dialogue with you. Uh, look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael.